Hi, thanks for joining me today. Um, I'm really delighted to be joined by uh, Debbie McNamara, who's the Head of Learning and Development for DAISY Communications, um, just to share some time today to talk more about apprenticeships um, and what they mean within DAISY as an organisation and how the business has embraced them. So thanks for joining me today, Debbie. That's brilliant. Thanks for having me, Andy. No worries at all. So listen, from my point of view, really great starting point is just tell us a bit about DAISY as an organisation and your role within the business. Okay, so I'm Head of Learning and Development of Daisy Communications. So we are one of the UK's largest independent business to business telecom providers. Um, we've got about between three, uh, 500 and 550 staff, um, normally based at five different uh, locations across the UK. But of course, um, in the last couple of years, we're all working from home and working from remote, remote locations and working sort of virtually and hybridly and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you talked about obviously the organisation and, and I suppose the structure and I suppose the last couple of years, as you said, has been very challenging for a lot of organisations and it's required a lot of adaptation home working, hybrid working, remote working, how's that worked and how's that sort of affected, you know, learning and development within DAISY as an organisation? Oh gosh, it's, it's dramatically changed learning and development within an organ within the organisation. I joined just prior to um, the the evolution of home working and things like that, and, and all the changes that happened in twenty twenty. So prior to that, you know, we'd been very much within the face to face arena, but taking things more virtually, you know, getting people more on board with on learning, much more blended learning approaches, and I'll be honest, much more bite sized. So gone are the days where you know you're doing two, three, four, five days programs mm. you know we're down to two hours and programs spread over a longer period of time which for me really helps embed that learning back in the workplace quickly if you do things in small bite-sized chunks then actually it's a better chance of it transferring back to the business and getting the business change where we need it definitely and you said you came in uh, sort of a couple of years ago just sort of uh, just prior to the start of um, the world sort of falling off its axis and going slightly crazy, should we say? So, you know, <laughs> so learning and development at Daisy. What, what, you know, what does that look like as a landscape, and what's your role within that? Um, I, I look after the strategy and everything learning and development within Daisy. Um, so, you know, from onboarding, upskilling, and and in a, and everything beyond that. I also look after the apprenticeship programs that we've got going and any apprenticeship opportunities. Um, we we are a small team, so there's myself and my colleague who um, who look after all of this for Daisy. But you know, something that we're very proud of at the moment internally is we're actually raising trainer skills because we're running a, a train the trainer program to widen that ability to deliver training to other other teams other parts of the business because we're we're a very large business and we're a very passionate business about learning and development and about training um so great. yeah it's great good stuff and 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 you mentioned apprenticeships there obviously it's national apprenticeship week um, that's what we're here to kind of talk about so so talk to me about apprenticeships at daisy what you know what do apprenticeships at daisy look like and, and why do apprenticeships at daisy matter well, I'll be honest, we've been on a bit of a journey with apprenticeships at Daisy. Um, like most companies, I think apprenticeships weren't necessarily um, a, a big thing until mm. the, the levy came about. And like most companies, I think it has taken us a little bit of a while to get to grips with our apprenticeship programs and what we're going to do with it. So when I came on board, we'd had some successes with ad hoc apprentices. So we've, mm -hmm. you know, we've got a number of our IT team has come through the apprenticeship program successfully in the stage of the business and there's been other what one-offs within the business um, and then we started to look at it for developing our current staff mm -hmm. so particularly with yourselves um, we invested in our uh, team leader population and the operations manager so that's the level three and level five qualification and that we, we had a lot of learnings from that, I think it's mm. fair to say. Um, mm. But the apprenticeship has evolved over the last, uh, since, my, since I've been here for the last two years, and we're now trying to go for much more of um, a blended approach, whereby we're starting now to invest in new apprentices coming into the business as well, mm -hmm. as well as using our part to develop current staff, or, you know, on an identified basis. So it's been a really interesting journey, and just slow feel like we're getting to grips with it <laughs> i don't think that's unique i think a lot of organizations are probably very similar that uh, yeah. as you say the 
early adopters are probably the ones who've kind of learned the most and probably picked up the most war wounds, so to speak. So, uh, yeah, yeah definitely true. So, so it's really interesting. You said about that pivot, you kind of started off and you had some ad hoc success maybe with apprentices coming in. And then there was this kind of moment where it seemed to pivot into developing of staff who were already in the business. What, what brought that thinking about? And I suppose when you then started that process, how did you take that message to incumbent staff who were already in situ? Well, I think that, I think it, I, it came apart because effectively there was, for want of a phrase, there was, there was a pot of money there available mm. for staff, and we have we had a need at the time for um, leadership and management development skills. So I'll, I'll say so a lot of this was prior to my coming on board. So I I am um, I came on board at the end of this, and I, I took this program across the line. Um, so I think it was just a. Uh, uh, an, an approach to go out and say look you know there's a lot of people that have been asking for either team leader development or you know the operations management development mm. so that next level that middle management or moving up to that strategic leader level and so they went to market they found um, a great provider a partner to work with of course as yourselves and then what we did was we opened it up internally and, and, and the model that they took at that time was to um, put together two internal co Boards. Mm -hmm. but we started quite big with a lot of people on both of those programs um and, and i know that there was an awful lot of work done up front about advising of their level of work and, and 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 you know the level of commitment that's required but i think this is where potentially we went a little bit too big too quickly because we suddenly realized having 12 team leaders on an apprenticeship with that yeah, yeah. <laughs> And a day job, and a day job to do somewhere and a, underneath. And, it. A, and a day job for the business. <laughs> yeah. And it was similarly for the operations manager. And I don't think that there was quite the understanding of how much mm. um, development was required by those individuals. So I will say that there was a lot of attrition from that, mm. that original program. Now, those that stuck with it have um, gone through and they finished last year. And, you know, every single one who stuck with it has achieved a distinction, which is absolutely amazing. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely amazing. And, and you know, we've reaped the rewards of, you know, they're, they're working better, they're working more strategically, they've grown their career within Daisy, which is amazing. But I think the lessons we learned there was, was much better to work with smaller cohorts for our internal staff development, making sure that the program was really, really um correct for mm. the job that they are doing we have another team who prior to my coming on board jumped onto another one which was more technical and they're now struggling with some of the elements of the apprenticeship whereby it isn't relevant for them right. and so but you know with in order to achieve the apprenticeship and, and get the qualification of course they've then got to do those bits that are relevant for them as well so yeah, yeah. a lot of learnings I think there's this great appetite of why wow, we've got this part of money let's develop our staff because as I said I, I've never worked at a company yeah. that's so passionate about learning and development that's amazing yeah, but yeah we've had to really take some learning like you say the early adopters took a few hits <laughs> yeah no definitely definitely and it's really interesting because it sounds like as you said you've constantly used those experiences and those challenges to kind of learn and think about how do we take something from this but continue with our vision which is that this has a real value within the business and for the people within our business which is great I'm interested in that kind of that starting point though with the existing staff because one of the challenges I suppose a lot of um, people have around apprenticeships is the, the name right yeah, you know, yeah I'm an existing staff member you know I might have been in the business for a few years and you're telling me I have to be an apprentice so how did you navigate your way around that or what did you do internally to try and maybe rebuild the perception of apprenticeships to your existing staff members I'll be perfectly honest we, we were kind of strayed away from calling it an apprenticeship program we knew it was an apprenticeship program but they weren't becoming an apprentice mm. I, think, I think that was the, the key difference so if I look to our recruitment that we're doing right now mm. which is the next step where we're starting to bring on we are bringing on apprentices and, mm. and developing them that way but for our internal staff we didn't turn around and say you are now an apprentice we are saying there is a, this apprenticeship program with all these different um, skills and behaviours and knowledge that you can develop yourself. And it's done within a, an a, a, a framework to get you the knowledge and, and put it in a way that, you know, you can put that straight to the business immediately. So we, we kind of stepped away from, yes, it's got the label of apprentice, but this mm. doesn't mean you're an apprentice. I mean, I've just had a request a few weeks ago for an, a level six apprentice 
apprentice. So that perception is changing within the business. You know, we're recognizing we've not done enough to leverage our funds. So we're starting to find more ways of doing that. And mm. I don't think we're unique with businesses there. Well, no, you only have to look at the amount of money the government's managed to kind of bring back from un unspent levy across Very organizations so. to kind of see that uh, there's a lot of companies that probably haven't even thought to try and do anything. So I think the first thing is to start the process and then learn through the experience. So that's yeah. definitely so. And, and what about, you know, uh, with your apprentice, as you say, there's there's a there's an alignment piece in there, but there is obviously a business as usual. So, you know, as the market has been volatile, you know, market's been challenging and it's sort of ebbed and flowed and people's work, work and home lives have ebbed and flowed. What have you done to kind of make sure that the, the people can balance the work pressures of an apprenticeship with the demands of being part of your business and what that what that requires? Yeah, that's been a really, really interesting challenge, to be honest. Um, and I think that is probably the biggest challenge for anybody considering an apprentice, which is balancing this off the work element and the mm. study element that goes along with um, with, you know, working as business as usual. I mean, for us, moving into the hybrid workspace has been phenomenally, um, it's been phenomenally be beneficial because it allows people to spend some time in work as well as spend some time at home and, and actually focus on the studies there. We've worked very hard to look at projects that both benefit the apprentice and actually help them develop, but also will benefit the business. So we're looking at them working with those, you know, some of those workplace projects and assignments mm. that have got to be done, but making sure that they've got a real business value so it's not just a matter of here's a project that you've got to do to get an apprenticeship here's something that's going to add real business value as well which has made it easy to build into that business as usual model I mean we have we've explored allowing one day a week or allowing you know rigid time scales and for some people that works for some people it doesn't it's working flexibly with that person with that department with that apprenticeship to figure out what works best for them and I think that's when what's that's been our true success also advising people to get on it early it's not something that you can just do at the end and register all yeah. your hours at the end it's not possible yeah it's a it's one of these uh, one of these things I think I would have been challenged by it given I'm one of these kind of I was a, a serial crammer at school and college and university so I was one of these people going if you give me a deadline I know I've got 24 hours and several cans of Red Bull to be able to get stuff done and it's uh yeah. It challenges, but the, I suppose mean, sometimes that's positive, right? Maybe uh, have you seen that in terms of maybe challenging the ways people to of organize themselves and time manage and prioritize and things like that? Yeah, very much so. Um, th there has been a change in that prioritization. And certainly when you talk to some of the managers of the people who've mm. gone through the apprenticeship, what they've seen, they've seen a marked difference, particularly with our level five apprentices um, and, and the way they started to approach their businesses or the way they started to approach the more strategic elements of what they mm. were doing and step up and really, you know, that's that's us investing in our leaders of tomorrow, yeah. which, which has been amazing. And the fact that, you know, it took a while for that change to happen it didn't happen it wasn't just I'm on an apprenticeship we'll go it was that 12 to 18 month journey but towards the end of that journey all of a sudden it was like the lesson started to to um to land and those those behaviors started to change which is amazing we've got you know three people starting on the team leader actually that they're, they're onboarding tomorrow believe it or wow, not okay so we'll start we're starting again with three more but again we've done it very carefully we've not done a big closed cohort we've gone with an open cohort mm. which for me i think you get a lot of benefit from communicating with other industries as well and taking lessons from other people and you know that peer learning that is so valuable to this um so i'm going to be very interested to watch their journey yeah definitely as well definitely. As you know, we've 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 gone from we started with onboarding a couple of apprentices and using it ad hoc to trying to use it all internally. We're now onboarding apprentices yeah. again right now, and one of our greatest um, wins recently, G, um, the government kickstart scheme yes. was, was out last year. So we actually employed a number of people through the government kickstart scheme, and one of those has just converted to a marketing apprenticeship. Brilliant! Which is absolutely amazing. So um, at the moment. I'm, I'm, I'm sourcing a marketing a digital marketing apprenticeship for this um, for this new starter which is which is brilliant and then that's the way we want to do you know we bring in that new talent we yeah. help them invest in themselves and hopefully get them to grow a career yeah and that's I mean that's obviously the these, these schemes joining together really is 
evidence of, of when the system works well and and how, as you said, it can provide somebody with that point of entry into an organization and a, a clear pathway to a career. So that's, uh, yeah. that's great to hear. I mean, obviously you've, you've given that's a great example. I suppose the, the kind of outcome for your level five learners is a great example of, of successes. Are there, are there any other things across the different standards you've done, the, the different learners that you've had that, that are either finished or in process that you really earmark as successes that really evidence, I suppose, the importance and value programs can provide? That's a really interesting question. Um, I think some of the successes that I can say is people who have stayed with us. So if I look at the IT apprentice that was recruited five years ago, completed the apprenticeship and is now a valued member of our IT team. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is um, an individual actually joined the HR team um, and she did a recruitment apprentice, but has actually since grown her career and has moved more into the health and safety area right. and potentially, you know, look at looking to continue to develop, you know, those for me are great successes. Um, we do have a couple of level six who are still on program, you know, and they're very much looking at getting their qualifications. And I think that's something that can't be um, forgotten about is within the apprenticeship. And that's sometimes a way of getting over the line is that for the more senior people, it's a way of getting perhaps those university qualifications, mm. those um professional qualifications that are not you know it's not possible or it's cost prohibitive or it's time prohibitive and things like that so there's a couple of people still on program there and um the other thing we're doing at the moment is we're now investing in some of our frontline teams and so areas where we're finding it difficult to recruit we've we've changed those roles into an apprenticeship to be able to start to bring in a pipeline of talent within to the business so it's great to hear that kind of full circle, really, where you've gone from where you started to where you got to, to almost that success driving back the revisiting of how you can use it to be a vehicle for, for new talent. Obviously, you know, the, the theme of National Apprenticeship Week this year is, again, build the future. So where where are apprenticeships helping to build the future for DAISY? And I suppose the second part of that question is, what do you see the future of apprenticeships looking like within DAISY um, as the business moves forward? Okay, well, build the future for Daisy. It, it, they're, they're absolutely pivotal for what we do from bringing in that, you know, that new starter and that ground talent and growing talent internally to actually growing our leaders of tomorrow. So, you know, we've, we're doing that at all levels with the, with, the, with the new starters and with our development inside. So but building the future, they're absolutely pivotal to us. So can you repeat the second question? Yeah, yeah. And I suppose the, sort of the, the, the second question for me really is what's the future of apprenticeships in Daisy as you see it? So where do you see... Where do you see the business continuing to go with apprenticeships? Where do you see the business being able to expand or, or, or increase opportunities for apprenticeships for existing staff or even for new apprentices within the business? I think it's going to be interesting to see how the apprenticeship standards uh, evolve as we go forward as well and what else is going to be out there. Mm. Um, you know, we're, we are back at the beginning of our journey of bringing in new apprentices. So if we get some really great successes within our, our frontline teams for our operations and within the digital marketing um, area, then I'm seeing that as being an opportunity to widen that as a proper apprenticeship program across the different levels of the business. So within ourselves, within our operations teams, the, the, you know, the team leaders, they've got the opportunity to go on to the level fives. And then as and when we need, we spoke apprenticeships as I said there was one that came across my desk a couple of weeks ago looking at it's a level six qualification it's very very technical um so I don't know it's 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 this I think we've only scratched the surface of what apprenticeships can do yeah. and it's taken us quite a while to learn the lessons um we've not been utilizing our levy to to the fullest and that's something that we definitely want to do going forward and just finding that mixed model of new talent to sort of bring in the future as well as developing our existing staff as well in the right place at the right time and not just a here you go <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Let's see if this works or not, and uh, yeah, sort of, yeah. Uh, yeah think, think, fingers crossed. Hope for the. And it's really interesting because, yeah, I think, um, you know, you, you know, my my sort of uh, my, my my challenge with the apprenticeships when I talk to organisations, as you said, is making sure that there's that clarity of purpose about why an organisation wants to use a program, what the actual objective or the business you know sort of goal is for for doing so because without that link it, it it doesn't feel like it has something tangible you can review it against measure it against but also 
you know, sort of commit it against when it comes to the, the challenges that you've already talked about in your programs that you faced maybe in the kind of the early stages. And I, I want to pick up on that point a little bit, which is, you know, in your role in from an L&D perspective, you know, there'll be L&D people potentially watching this, there'll be HR people potentially watching this, some of them may never have used apprenticeships before. What would be your kind of, you know, maybe your top two or three things you would advise them to think or consider before they do choose to use apprenticeships? Because, you know, as we've talked about, it's not necessarily the right solution for everybody. No, it's not. Um, I think that, that there are, they are one tool in, in the toolbox for L&D um, yeah. and they can be a very valued tool. What would be my top three tips? Um, make sure that the content is business relevant for the individual that you're putting through or for the apprenticeship you want to bring in. There's yeah. a lot of apprenticeships out there that, um, you know, about 60% fit and they go, oh, that'll do, that'll give us the 60% we need, but they won't ever achieve that apprenticeship without the additional 40%, at which yeah. point you're then spending time doing training. So where possible, make sure the content and that you do that at the outset, find a great provider to work with that's going to work with the way you want to work as a business as a business so mm. you know we've got we've got a great relationship with yourself I've got great relationships with our two or three other providers that we use regularly for our specialist apprenticeships mm. but actually find take time to find that partnership that's going to work and make sure that the um that you know the way of learning is going to work that you're getting that support you need to make sure that those people can do get the evidence they need to really succeed at the end of the apprenticeship um and finally sit down with whoever you are considering going on apprenticeship and just really really make sure that they're clear on the level of commitment that's required and yeah. that that can you can almost make it sound a little bit onerous but it's not about that but an apprenticeship it isn't a one-day course tick in the box there you go back yep. you know you've had a nice lunch back back to the day job it is a, an investment it is it's a marathon not a sprint and the value you will get out of that marathon is immense hmm. but you've got to be prepared for that so there you go yeah make sure the standards right make sure you provide us right and you're working with somebody that's going to work with you and make sure the learner is super clear on what they're letting themselves in for yeah no i think they're great tips great tips and i, I yeah, you know, I totally agree. I think um, you almost you almost have to kind of paint the pictures the worst it can be in terms of the kind of commitment and the, you know, the demands it's going to put on them and, and the challenges of developing or strengthening the behaviours they've got to be able to juggle it so yeah. that they, they really sort of, uh, you know, make a considered decision. Because like you say, once they're committed, you want them committed because the business is supporting them, the business is funding them, but also yeah. the business is, is making that sort of um, opportunity available as part of that kind of succession planning or, or development opportunity for their careers in your business so yeah really really good and I, I want to come back around very quickly to the, the kind of the new apprentice thing very quickly because we kind of touched on it and we talked about it a little bit but um, maybe sometimes there's a bit of a stigma about when when you're talking about hiring apprentices about what that might look like you know what does the person's profile look like what does the person's you know sort of prior experience or academics or anything like that look like so you know, again, what what what's what does hiring apprentices meant to you at Daisy when it's come to kind of sourcing talent? What's the kind of what's the range of individuals that you've looked for, and and why has that been an important thing to come back to? Okay, so as a business, Daisy Grocery Acquisition, so a company we we acquired last summer, um, actually had a lot of success with this first line instant management apprenticeship. So we we interviewed them, we looked at their successes, we looked at what they'd done to bring people in, and thought, okay, we have got a huge gap here within our recruitment area. You know, we we had a, a particular role. It's a very specialised, it's a very technical role. Um, you know, we're a tele comms business we work with all you know a lot of the different technologies I don't even speak some of the technologies that we work <laughs> with so to actually source people to come in and be able to support people when they were having the faults of the technologies it's a very specialist role so having that apprenticeship in the first instance to go ah that's the right standard and now we've got um you know somebody within the business who's worked with that successfully so we started to then work with our um 
as another provider that we're working with and in truth they're doing the recruitment for us because they're the specialists in this area mm. so we've sourced through um i think there's a newspaper advert at the moment we've sourced through job centers we've sourced through social media we sourced through the online we sourced through the national apprenticeship side and then we've just been doing interviews but i think looking for a breadth of experience something that can be quite off-putting sometimes I think is this functional skills element of an apprenticeship and people can be quite off-put by the oh I haven't got the GCSE level C maths and English when in truth the vast majority of people are more than capable of doing the apprenticeship and what we need to do is just help them tick the box in terms of the foundational skills piece so it's not being closed-minded to that and making sure that we've got the tests in place but it's for us particularly with the functional skill uh, not, not functional skill sorry with the um the operations team and that specialist first line support role it was very much about them having the aptitude that yep. right um yeah, the right, the right fit, and I, I hate to say that because it's not a very scientific way well, of what, I, I, for it. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. I think it's really interesting. I mean, I think um, I was going to pose you a slightly provocative question, which is oh, in terms of, in terms of kind of, yeah, obviously the world is kind of been brought up and you listen like yeah what we do at Pareto we've we've very much actively promoted graduates for the last 25 years of our our business but I suppose my, my challenge moving forward is you know graduates apprentices you know is it an either or is it an also and what 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 what, what what's your view on that um I actually think it's I think it's an also and if I'm honest um I I've worked with graduate programs in previous organizations that have been phenomenally successful I've worked with apprentices with this with this organization other organizations that you know have struggled to leave school at 16 mm. with the qualifications and have gone on to be phenomenal successful within their industries that they've worked with I think if the business puts the right support around them and they get the right development you know the the traditionally academic route of, your, of the university isn't for everybody and so with the apprenticeship they get the opportunity to come into work to be earning some money and um, to be working and putting things practically adult learning is very different to academic learning yeah. you know adult learners they want to work more in the in the real world they want to develop themselves they want to actually be given sort of credit for the experience that they have and i think sometimes with apprenticeships that's what they can do so yeah. they can actually put that into practice immediately within a business context in a real life example where they're seeing the the the, the um the oh god brain's gone um <laughs> they're seeing the results of the yeah. work that they're putting in immediately and they're seeing it on a business perspective they're getting that immediate feedback as opposed to potentially going through the university and you're getting all the theoretical knowledge and then when you come to the business world it's very different no no listen i it's really interesting hearing that insight from you you know from an employer's perspective because i think yeah. it's it's definitely a big thing i'd say in the in the market at the moment is you know it, it is this kind of you know sort of um battle of what talent of the future looks like and and you know what makes what makes the right talent and and is there a sort of there's no one size fits all but it's kind of a what will talent look like what should be that kind of journey to get there and lots of organizations i suppose are maybe being challenged around this kind of concept of setting the bar at must have a degree or must have this qualification or must have that you know level of grade because that that negates maybe some of the best talent that could come into their organizations and be yeah. long-term assets to what they're trying to achieve so. No, that's very much not the way at Daisy. Yeah. Um, you know, the graduate program is not something that would be on my radar at the moment. We're very much about growing internally and certainly growing internally um, as you as you got the levels as well. If you look at our board, the most of them came through the business themselves. So yeah, yeah. Um, I've got a question for you to, to kind of almost wrap up on, which is um, if, if there was anything that you you know, with your experience of working within apprenticeships and working with apprenticeships in your organization, if there's anything that you would like to maybe sort of change or improve about the system. And you can, you can only have one thing, I'm afraid, Debbie, so just in case I'm opening Pandora's box here, I'm going to limit it to one thing. But yeah, you know, either one thing you'd improve or one thing that you'd like to add that isn't currently there that you think as an employer, that would be a real thing for us. What, what, what do you think apprenticeships could do to be better? 
oh, you've only given me one thing. That's really, really hard. It's a qualified, it's a qualified opportunity for you. That's why. <laughs> I was going to say, I could go more in peace on that one. Um, I think sometimes the rigidity um, of the standard that is in place and that you can only use of this standard mm. with this, Mm. with this part of money I think if I, one thing would change apprenticeships going forward would maybe be some a flexibility in the standards or the ability to be able to take I'll have a piece from that standard and a piece of that standard and a piece from that standard to bespoke create an apprenticeship that's really fit for purpose I think that would be the one big I think one big thing to change I mean there are something like 600 700 different apprenticeships out there but I, I you know I spend a lot of time reading them and then I'll get to one and go, well that's not relevant for my business so I'll put that one to one side so there's a you know there's about 600 700 there's maybe about five that are directly relevant for our mm. business so but there's elements in a lot of the other ones where I think well that could be great or that could be great so that ability to still within a framework yeah. but almost be able to choose your you know your your core modules and your optional modules so maybe it's pathways yeah, and it's and you know, in some ways, it's interesting because the risk, I suppose, maybe is the fact that apprenticeships could become quite similar to degree subjects at university, where you sort of go away and you study for three years and you learn some things which are really relevant and really applicable and can can be applied into your vocation, and then you kind of have to do these other things around it because they're part of what the course requires, but they're not necessarily part of what your your kind of future career is going to require. So it's how you continue to make them maybe commercially relevant, as you said there. By, yeah. by sort of having content that really enriches skills, knowledge and behaviours that are applicable to what these people are doing and, and their pathways within your business. Exactly that, yeah. I think so, yeah. More flexibility. I think that if, if I could change anything, I think that would be the one thing I, I, I would ask for and that ability to be able to tailor the apprenticeship so it's absolutely fit for purpose for the business. Brilliant. Good stuff. Well, listen, Debbie, it's been really exciting hearing you talk. I, I, I think I might call you every Monday because your energy and your passion for <laughs> apprenticeships is definitely uh, infectious. I'll give you that. And uh, hopefully there's some really interesting stuff there that people can uh, listen and learn from your journey and your experience at Daisy with apprenticeships. So thank you very much for your time today. Brilliant. Thank you very much for, um, for letting me waffle on a bit. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. No worries. Thanks, Debbie.